make a demand. Right to life, right to liberty. Justice, justice for me. Justice with Jamaicans for Justice. My name is Mikkel Jackson, Executive Director of JFJ. And my name is Jade Williams, the Policy and Advocacy Specialist at JFJ. Now we're going to be switching things up a little bit because I think last week was a heavy week for the country. The details of the Office of the Children's Advocate OCA report on the investigation that took place with the Child Protection and Family Services Agency around what is being called the Robansky scandal, if you will. Yes. It's something we're going to be discussing for today, not only to go through the blame that seemingly and rightfully has been placed at the feet of the CPFSA, but I, I, I hope we can have a discussion today in terms of where we have been and where we need to go. We need to put some actions in place. So the usual human rights of the week recap, we're going to shift that to, to the second half of the program, Jade. And we're just going to get right into the conversation so the public can really understand the institutional issues that have been plaguing the child protection sector for decades now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, before we get into our, quick, our discussion, I just want to quickly do our right of the day and ask our trivia question for the week. So our right of the day today is the right of children to a life free from cruelty. And it essentially states that cruelty to a child is a criminal offense. And this includes assaulting physically the child, causing the child to be assaulted or treating the child in a neglectful manner, abandoning the child or exposing the child to certain forms of harm. Um, so the child has a right to be protected from these forms of harm and it is a criminal offense. And we go straight into our trivia where it asks, what is the minimum fine and term of imprisonment for those persons who have been found guilty of child abuse? So what we described about the cruelty for those persons found guilty of that, what is the maximum fine or offense? And we go straight into our discussion for today. Now, as we articulated at the start of the program, the conversation is going to be focusing on the child protection sector. And I just want to put a few things in perspective that what we have been hearing in the news, and we will recap in short order, is nothing new. It has been plaguing our sector for some time now. It has been plaguing the country for some time now. Um, for example, in 2003, a former Jamaican for Justice board director and former executive director as well, K. Osborne, attempted and did adopt a child from who was a ward of the state. And when she adopted that child, it came to light that the child was sexually abused while in the care of the state. And that revelation sparked an investigation that was undertaken by retired Sadie Keating, now, who is now deceased. And we commonly refer to what is now called the Keating Report. Mm -hmm. And that report, if you will, highlighted several challenges facing the child protection sector. Nutritional issues, you know, not enough monitoring. Um, I remember former predecessor, uh, um, Carolyn Gomes, Dr. Carolyn Gomes, making a lot of public noise then, asking for recommendations to be made, action to be done. Now, following that Keating report, it resulted in what we now refer to in law as the Child Care and Protection Act that was passed in 2004. Fast forward again now, you're talking about several investigations and reports coming from Jamaican for Justice included, where in 2020 we looked and examined over 1,600 incidents mm -hmm. um, affecting the child protection sector. Um, and some of those challenges we are going to be making reference to. We look at a Capri report that was released in 2021. I remember Dr. Leon Levers going through some of the findings and they were quite alarming because the question we keep asking ourselves, how are we here again? Mm -hmm. So we're going to be reading some things from the, the Capri report, 10 things to know about Jamaica's system of state care for children, but we're going to be summarizing as we go along. So let me start out by saying that the Child Protection and Family Services Agency, CPFSA, 
was actually merged in 2017 with the Child Development Agency and the Office of the Children's Registry then. And the CPFSA, as it is now called, is responsible for over 4,800 of the nation's children between the ages of 0 to 18. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, while there is direct responsibility for 0 to 18, there was an understanding that those who were transitioning from the homes 18 and over needed some more care and support because we have to remind ourselves why the children came to be wards of the state because a number of them are victims if you will, of sexual abuse and neglect within their homes. So the CPFSA is the nation's child protection agency that is responsible for those children who have been neglected in different ways. Yes? Unfortunately, though, the CPFSA, with that great responsibility, is severely under-resourced. Um, in our general understanding of Child care and protection is that a social worker, for example, should be assigned in a severe in cases where there is severe abuse or need for intensive services, as the report says, five to ten cases per social worker, where it is less intensive, low intensive, twenty to thirty cases um, per social worker. Under our current system, each social worker has up to 150, up to 200 children assigned to them um, for their supervision. Now, as we articulated earlier, we must remind ourselves of why children come in conflict. Um, sorry, not conflict with the law, no, yes, no. but came to be care within the, the, the care of the state. Again, abuse in a number of instances. Now, though some of those circumstances are predominantly the reason behind it, we know um, in some instances because parents and, and families are not able to provide the necessary care and support for the children and so on. Now, one of the conversations around children in state care is the need for deinstitutionalization. In other words, though the state is mandated to provide care. We recognize some of the ills which we're going to be discussing that can very well happen. You want a child to be among families. So that's the first choice mm -hmm. for a child. If the immediate family can't take care of the child, then the state would try and see how the cousins, the aunts, and so on can provide support. So deinstitutionalization is the first preference. Um, outside of the institutionalization, we talk about foster care as, as well. Um, those who can provide short-term care and support for the children. I think the last I checked, it was either $8,000 or $12,000 that a family can be compensated to be providing foster care support mm -hmm. for children. And I know the CPFSA during Christmas period, for example, mm -hmm. would ask Jamaican citizens to take a child in with their families. Yes. Outside of that, we're talking about adoption as another avenue to employ placing children with families permanently. Now, there are a number of gaps when it comes to the adoption process, and the government has been asked several times over the years to ensure that necessary protocols are in place, but you want the adoption process certainly to be fast-tracked, where children can leave the state and be placed with a loving family. Absolutely. And I would say those aren't the only reforms that we would have asked the government to consider. Um, we would have also talked about the Child Care and Protection Act. I think as JFJ, we've talked about it extensively. And we, not only us, but also Capri and several other NGOs would have identified several areas where there needs to be some improvement in the legislative framework. Um, one of them that is poignant for our discussion today, for example, is that a judge currently under the CCPA doesn't have the power to prevent a sexual predator from contact with a child by court order. Um, so those are some of the things that we could see improvement in our legislative framework for. No, I'm sure it will come up at some point in a discussion about the weak governance framework. I want to point out that the Child Protection um, and Family Services Agency is an executive agency, mm -hmm. and that was a part of the public sector modernization program um, that was undertaken to ensure that you have agencies that have some independence in raising their own funds and, and, and governing themselves. Now, within the context of the CPFSA, the conversation becomes what is the 
administrative capacity of the agency itself? What is the oversight mechanism to ensure that the CPFSA is adhering to its mandate? How is the relationship between the Office of the Children's Advocate who is mandated to ensure that the rights of the child is advocated for and so protected? One of the conversations that we're also going to be having is the is the issue of the board of directors of the CPFSA not being one that can have the power and authority, if you will, to mandate the strategic direction of the CPFSA, but rather the board of the CPFSA is an advisory one. Mm -hmm. So in other words, when recommendations are given, it's a non-binding one. The CPFSA and its leadership can opt to follow or not follow, if you will, mm -hmm. and that is something that agencies have asked to be reviewed over the years. So that's an institutional accountability mechanism that certainly requires some further review. And as we talk about oversight, we also have to talk about the lack of data collection within the child protection um, areas where there is inaccurate numbers as to how many children, for example, are in state care. There is inaccurate, inaccurate inadequate information mm -hmm. about their quality of life while in state care there are no um there's no data for us to analyze to see what is the necessary infrastructural changes that need to be made within the system um and yeah. and, and and before we even get into the conversation i want to point out that several of these reports the government have indicated that they have made some attempts to fix it we're saying to the government of jamaica not enough not fast enough because we did not need to be here again today. So having said that, um, on Tuesday, January 10th, the Office of the Children's Advocate tabled a report in Parliament regarding alleged sexual misconduct um, surrounding Mr. Carl Robanski of the International Organization or United States Organization Embracing mm -hmm. Orphans. Now, the report made several damning conclusions, including the fact that the transitional home housing both minors and those over 18 years old um, saw Mr. Robanski, who had a sexual misconduct within his history, where his education license was removed um, at some point. Uh, he was still in contact with the children. I want to point out at this stage that though this report came to light recently, this matter was made public in March of 2021 that the CPFSA knew of Mr. Robanski's history. And there were several media interviews, including the CPFSA Chief Executive Officer, Miss Rosalie Gage Gray, where she indicated that though she knew of Mr. Robanski's history in 2018, she believed that though he was not con he was not convicted mm -hmm. and therefore she did not see the immediate harm because those who were within the transitional home they were actually over 18 and we know that the report dispelled and disproved that particular point Absolutely. Um, and this comes in the context of a 2018 report that we would have produced at JFJ jointly with um, the United Nations Children Fund that you referenced earlier, Mikael, when we discussed Capri's report um, that analyzed over 1,600 incidents, including physical and sexual abuse um, of children that resulted in them attempting suicide or self-harming. Um, and these are, of course, children living in state care. Um, and the data revealed that girls were substantially more likely to be the victims of these issues and also to um, escalate to attempting suicide or having harmed themselves as a result. Now, Jamaicans for Justice, we responded having read the report in great detail last week. And it's a timely report from the Office of the Children's Advocate. Now, JFJ, having read the report and making a reference beyond the report, mm -hmm. but also due to the circumstances of 2021, believes that the Public Services Commission should move swiftly to suspend Mrs. Gage Gray, not because we are asserting any guilt on Mrs. Gage Gray. And we have to be very careful mm -hmm. because the CEO is entitled to due process. She is entitled to natural justice. However, the contents of the report and public utterances made by the CEO herself they do make room for concern to be there that an investigation cannot be had 
with the CEO remaining at the desk. So though she is entitled to due process, JFJ has called on the Public Services Commission, not the ministry, no, I want to be very clear, because again, due process must be followed, but we believe that in the interest of the public and for the investigation to continue, then we have to look at how best the CEO can temporarily be removed in furtherance of such investigation. And the organization called for several other institutional recommendations to be made as well, some of which Jade mentioned earlier, um, with the, the court mandating the sexual, any sexual offender, or sex offender rather, to be removed um, from a child, or to curtail such involvement, if you will. And we also look at the sex offenders registry. That's a conversation I know Jar Crawford would certainly yes. um, expound on in a few. So we have several other recommendations that we will be talking about during the course of the interview. Yes, the one thing I'd want to mention as well is that UNICEF made a, what is an important recommendation about uh, trying to find funding sources that would not allow for us to compromise the safety and rights of the children that are in Jamaica's state care. All right, so on the other side of this in um, the break, sorry, we're going to be joined by Carol Narcis, who's a human rights advocate and Joy Crawford, co-founder of E for Life. So we'll take a break and then we'll get straight into the interview. The people's champion. Your destination to Jamaica's music, culture, and vibes. The Bridge 99 FM. Imagine your advertising dollar reaching your Caribbean and diaspora target beyond borders in a single rotation. It happens only on the bridge. Call now to advertise 876-669-5000. Bridging the Caribbean gaps across the globe on social media. We are Facebooking, IGing, TikToking, and Twittering at the Bridge 99 FM. Rights we should all know. If any member of the security force hits you, abuses you, refuses to give you your phone call, or otherwise violates your rights, complain to the police on duty, the JP who visits the lockup, the public defender, the inspectorate of constabulary, or the police at the station. With every right, there is a responsibility. Brought to you by the Office of the Public Defender. It's 29 years of the People's Show! Let me tell you! 2023. Friday, January the 20th. Big Mountain! Third World! Cody Rap! Yaksta! Terry Lady! Abyssinia! Asian Bar! Tobacco Pyramid! Rodney Price! AKA Bounty Killer! Lady G! Louis Culture! 8 open 5 pm. Action begins 7 pm. Tickets are 8,500 pre sold and 9,000 at the gate. 29 years of niceness! The People's Show! Let me Endorsed by Bridge 99 FM. The Bridge 99 FM. Caribbean vibes amplified. The deepest champion. Our mission is love. Our vision is love. Welcome back to Let's Start Justice with JFJ. Just want to point out that at 1.30 when we take the break, persons can call into the program at 676-4996 and you can WhatsApp your comments to us at... Yes, you can WhatsApp your comments to us at 239-7583. I think I had a senior moment to just now, forgive <laughs> me. All right, so we're here joined with Joy Crawford, co-founder of e for Life and Carol Narcis, human rights advocate. And dare I say, um, a family within JFJ. Well, Joy is a family as well, so let me be careful here. <laughs> Welcome, ladies. <laughs> Thank you good so much. Everyone. Um, good afternoon to you both and to the listeners. Good afternoon, Joy. Hi, Carol. Happy New Year. Yes, thank you. And the same to you and everyone listening. Oh, Happy New Year. I think I haven't spoken to both of you and Jade. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Carol, I'll start with mm -hmm. you. You've read the OCA report. Yes. You know of the history of the child protection mm -hmm. sector and the challenges. Um, what is your immediate um, feedback to all that is happening? Uh, a few things. First of all, I want to say that 
We are where we are after a long, long history of reports being done um, on the situation of children in state care. Um, my association in the child development sector goes back many decades. My association with JFJ as part of that life experience also goes back a far way. And for each of those decades, there have been incidents um, that have come to public attention, created a big stir, one of which was very instrumental in, uh, in, in documenting for the first time the, the deep extent of the lack of systems and procedures and for care, actual care and protection of the welfare of children. Um, back in 2002, 2003, a young child was adopted by a Jamaican and the observance of the behavior of that child led that Jamaican, Kay Osborne, who, was, who then championed the issues, led that Jamaican to say, no man, this can't just be this child alone. You were talking serious, serious, sexually predatory behavior of what I think was then a six, seven-year-old child, if my memory serves me right. The, the, the outcry that resulted, well, the efforts, of Ms. Osborne led to Sadie Keating of very blessed memory and to whom we should be very grateful as a nation, being charged with the, the task of investigating and writing a report on the situation of children in state care. That was in 2003. That report showed such levels of, of really state neglect. Um, such great levels of dereliction of duty of care uh, that the recommendations of the Keating report um, set out administrative things, care practice things that needed to be changed, um, due diligence procedures that needed to be in place to protect the children from predators because everybody knows that institutional care is a magnet for people with predatory behavior. Huh? So from 2003, successive governments have had a, a, um, a roadmap of things that needed to be changed. And yet, every single report since that time to today, when we now have the OCA's report on yet another scandalous, grievous um, um, situation of harm, to the children in state care. Every report that has been done, and there have been several, have said, this is what the weaknesses are, these are the fixes. So no government, including the current, can claim to not be deeply seized of what the needs are to fix the situation in the child care and protection system and to do so with alacrity. Second quick point. The reason why we have an approach to changing and fixing the system that is so bureau bureaucratic, it is focused more on administrative changes rather than some of the deeper things that are required. My um, view is that this is because at the heart of it, there is the culture of the, the state and the care systems for the wards of the state is not grounded in viewing the children as having the same level of value as our own children. Mm. The children of the ministers, the children of the heads of the agencies, the children of the, the care staff, etc. There isn't a culture that says these are children as important and as worthy and as valuable as our own. None of the people that I've mentioned who have a duty of care would leave their children, their own children and their relatives' children in the situations of harm, endangerment and neglect that 
that we have seen over several, several decades. So where the OCA report places, quite rightly, a lot of the responsibility and the, the charge of dereliction at the feet of the CEO and others, we as a society need to also be asking serious questions of ministers who, having given directives in, in 2021, could pay so little attention to the implementation of their directives as to be expressing surprise now in 2023 that they were not implemented and followed. That means that you didn't care enough to monitor and to insist on frequent reports on the implementation of those directives. So we have a systemic problem. The systemic problem is born out of the attitudes that we have towards the children who are wards of the state and their families who predominantly are children of the poor. Mm. All right. Thanks so much, Carol. Um, Joy, what was your immediate response? And I'll turn over to Jay thereafter because I know she has some burning questions to ask both of you. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Carol, for setting that um, context because I'm picking up where you ended. My immediate response, to be honest, was that as a society, we're very hypocritical. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my first honest thought because... I thought, what made this one different? What was making this particular situation now everybody in shock and crying in Parliament and how overwhelmed we are about this gentleman's um, association with the CPFC, I mean, of course, in the background of whatever, when we, on a daily basis here in Jamaica, with all the reports that were just mentioned, um, all the background that was laid out, Every single day, we have the situation of abuse, um, systemic abuse. The institutions are anemic when it comes to their funding, their technical capacity, um, the training, the basic, you know, clothing. I mean, going to school for everybody. Everything that a child deserves as a child's right does not exist. Mm -hmm. And we don't do this. And so my first reaction was, man, we are so hypocritical. We're going to run the risk now of having this white man issue that people are caring on about and the religious issue that people are caring about. And we're going to miss the boat again because all the things that we have outlined so far are the real issues. Yes, we have individuals who have um, duty that we should hold accountable as they carry out their work. However, I am very concerned that we are missing an opportunity if we are going to look at a few individuals only and don't look at the system. Yes. That was my first. I also am already seeing the, the, the smoke going away. The nine-day wonder. We, we, I see coming because there are so many other competitive things. We fire the CEO, what next? Yes. We fire many CEOs, what next? That's what I want to hear from the government. That's what I want to hear from the real duty bearers. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I'll say before I move on is, is too often when we are doing advocacy and antagonism in our country, we do it from an emotive space. Mm -hmm. It has to become a human rights issue. It has to become rights-based. It has to be the, the state obligation have to be there based on the conventions that we have signed on to, based on our obligations that we have said we will provide for our children. Those are the things that we need to use now to do the checklist to see where the failings are and how do we all, the ministers, they said heavy is the head that hold the crown. The CEO of the CPFSA is wearing one crown. Yes. But she's not the head, head, head. Yes. And I don't want us to forget that. So I really felt like, you know, you know, we, we're getting distracted with this story. Yes. And the facts are being lost. That was my initial reaction. 
Um, thanks, Joy and Carol. Um, before we take the break and come back, I'm just going to ask both of you to stay with us for a few minutes. And I want us to pick up. Carol made the point of the deeper issues or the deeper things that are required. And Joy, you touched on it. Um, though we agree that the leadership of the CPFSA must be held accountable, one of the concerns we had in the report was that the findings seemingly centered around the CEO rather than the deeper institutional failure that is clear. Where is the ministerial responsibility to ensure that these things were acted upon, as Carol rightly outlined, when the directives were given? What is the what next from the Parliament of Jamaica? Because they can't be absolved from any of this at all, because we have been making calls for the Child Care and Protection Act to be amended for some time. We've been getting an indication it would be amended since that time. Yes. <laughs> but, 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 but as our grandmothers will say, up to today day. Hmm. Yes? Yeah. So we're just going to take the break, and then on the other side of the break, we continue with the systemic changes that are required. <laughs> The people's champion. Our mission is love. Our vision is love. Still I do it big, big, big. KFC. KFC still I do it big. KFC big deal. The time by KFC big deal is 130. I put it down on the wrong one. Hold up. Wait a minute. On the bridge? Every Tuesday at 10 p.m. We talk about the forbidden, then every tower, the truth. Nothing is untouched. It's live with me, Dance Hall Queen Carlene. Download the Bridge app, be on the 99, and tune in this Tuesday after dark. The conversation is intellectual and may be tantric, but always entertaining as we hear from the expert and you. SOB, this Tuesday at 10 p.m. Lord Keisha, you hear about the little girl we get shot in the community last week? Oh, you mean? I'm here to say things are going to get even crazy, I know, because them boys are smuggling mm. some new gun the other day. If me could have said something without bad man here about my name, I would have talked with me know a long time, mm. you know, because for them foolishness, always come back for hurt the innocent people in the community. But you know, say, them have one program where you can actually get information to the police secretly, you know. Mm. Customs join up with Crime Stop and start one campaign named Tell Us, mm. so people can give tips and nobody nothing will say them. Them all give out money if the reward lead to an arrest or them can't find the gun them. Boy, honestly, me kind of afraid, you know. But things can't continue, so. Mm-hmm. Me ready to tell them when me know. You're right. We have to put a stop to it. The Jamaica Customs Agency wants you to tell us what you know. Call Crime Stop at 311 to share information about illegal guns and other contraband coming through our borders. The Jamaica Customs Agency, country above self. Yeah, this is Angie from Gardetown. In the square, right on Miss Lou's statue. Come check out Tentucky Drinking Salon with the top chef look at them. See them like how oh, you see the bridge, 99 FM to the world. It's 29 years of the people's show. Let me show you. 2023, Saturday the 21st of January. People turn that chair. Johnny Clark. Tickets are 8,500 pre sold and 9,000 at the gate. 29 years of niceness, the people show, Remis. Salute! Endorsed by Bridge 99 FM. KFC, we still are doing big, big, big. KFC, work hard every day with determination. Anything I set your mind to, you do it big. No one your potential. You are a real big dealer, you must win. SPIC in your area. KFC with the taste and the flavor. We are big deals, so our that we are all that we do. Big, big things we know. KFC fun. still are doing it big. KFC big D. Enjoy three pieces of delicious chicken fries and a Pepsi. Because big dreamers need a big deal. What up, New York? What up, Jam Down? It's the bridge. 99 FM. Champion. Welcome Our back mission. to Let's Talk Justice. Uh, we are joined by Carl Narcisse and Joy Crawford, and we are discussing the Office of the Children's Advocate report on 
Carl Rabansky that came out last week, tabled in Parliament last week, Tuesday. Um, so before we left, um, we spoke, well, both of you would have spoken about the fact that the report focuses on the CEO, um, but not on the deeper systemic changes that need to be made. And one of the things we highlighted prior to uh, starting the interviews with you is that the CPFSA is extremely under-resourced as an agency for what is expected of the agency. And that's just one of the challenges that um, they would have by, um, to implement their mandate. So I'd ask you, Ms. Narcisse, firstly, what other systemic changes do you think are necessary to improve the protection framework that we have for children in state care? In well, particular? one of the, yeah, I think one of the first things that we need to address is why this executive agency is so different from many other executive agencies in the role of the board. <laughs> uh, whose idea was that uh, and why? Because uh, many other executive agencies, if not most, have oversight boards, policy boards, mm -hmm. boards that are required by law to uh, produce and submit uh, in or an organizational plan. Um, and so they're not advisory boards, meaning they have no, you know, no directive capacity, no, 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 how, how is that being allowed? So that's one of the first things. This executive agency cannot continue to be a law unto itself. It cannot, because of how sensitive its role is, because it has the potential to have immediate life-threatening and life-damaging impact on, on children of the country, it cannot be left without a board that has proper board responsibilities um, subject to the provisions of the Public Bodies Management and Accountability Act, um, and all the other pieces of legislation that govern all other public boards, including those of, of statutory um, um, agencies and executive agencies. Um, the issue of who it is, where, where does the power re reside for the hiring and firing of the heads of the, the, the agency? If it is a services commission, what is the services commission's role and how does it need to be strengthened that needs to be looked at because it can't be that we hire folks but there is no for example um job evaluation right and if there is a job evaluation what are the indicators um because that needs to be strengthened so that the accountability of those officers can be strengthened and, and just to interject here the, the question is also is the challenge with the psc or is it with the ministry itself, Carol, in not exercising its own mandate well, in course. that regard? Well, we're coming to them. Okay. One of the problems is that the matters to do with children has been shifted around from ministries, different ministries over time. Huh? Um, I, in, in the past, it's been on the health. Uh, now it's on the education and youth, etc. So we have to settle on where it is. And then we have to um, insist on the parliament, the cabinet, in, in, beg pardon, has to exercise its authority and oversight responsibility and diligence, due diligence responsibility, to ensure that all the ministries, but in particular one such as this that has responsibility for children, um, that that. The, the, the ministerial oversight and the oversight and checks and balance that the permanent secretary, yes. because remember, permanent secretaries are the accountable officers of ministries of, of government, right? So the permanent secretaries has to play a, 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 a greater role in, in terms of their duty to oversee and ensure that the procedures are being followed, that resources are being expended, that the source of resources can stand up to scrutiny. How is it possible in 2021, 2019, et cetera, 
that people can come and offer to put up a facility or, or fund a, a facility, um, manage a facility for wards of the state, and you have not done a due diligence that includes a criminal background check. And if they come, whether they're from Jamaica or they're from abroad, wherever they are from, are from, how is it that we do not have an established system of back, criminal background check? I mean, nowadays, if you're applying for pretty much any job in Jamaica, you better come with a police record, mm -hmm. right? And yet here we have a system responsible for our children where that is not required for all comers, all comers, and that it be updated. So you bring it when you're coming. We get the due diligence when you are coming, and it has to be updated annually or whatever is a reasonable period of time because you can commit offenses at any point in the, in the, in the time, and, and we need to have a mechanism that alerts us to this. And before you move on from that point um, and, and we shift to Joy, one, one of the, the things that came from the report, um, one of the incidents, the young lady indicated that she was uncomfortable with the advances and conversations with Mr. Robansky. But because she knew the source of her tuition fees being paid mm -hmm. and the promise of overseas for the best child who was well behaved and so on, she kept quiet because she's and, seeing her future and, and she didn't want to compromise that. That's an understandable and that's part of the vulnerability of the, uh, the position of vulnerability. Absolutely. And why was that young lady told? Why were the children told of Mr. Robanski's interest? Yes. But, but, we can, but we can surmise from the OCA's report that the entire CPFSA operated on that same consideration, it yes. seems, right? He is doing for us. He is a source we can go to for, for, for the things. And so we're going to wink and nod um, and not be too aggressive mm -hmm. in our demands that they meet certain standards. standards. So, you know, elsewhere it's been described as, as a propensity to be licky-licky. Well, I wouldn't describe the children in that way because... I understand completely uh, that youngster who has no other idea of how they're going to get out of the terrible, dire situation of their life from the time they were children, little children, to, to the point where they're now in the transitional facility at approaching 18 or 18 uh, and above, right? So, yes, if you see a route where your education is being paid for, it's a perfectly understandable response to say, you know what, I'm just going to hold my corner, suffer, and make my way through. Uh, and so the duty of care is really more on the adults to ensure that that child's interests are protected, that young person, that young adult. All right. Thanks so much, Carol. Um, Joy, what were some of the recommendations from your side? Um, well... One thing is clear that as we go forward, well, first of all, we have to go and clean up the responsibility. Um, up to now, I'm not clear who is really understand that they're responsible for the nation's children and what is the plan, as we have heard Carol mention, is going to be laid out um, from a statutory perspective to protect the children of our country and not have them all over the place. And there, are many, there have been many missteps, many missteps with our children, and not just the CPFSA, but just how we valued them, um, how we have treated them as human beings, and how we have treated them purely on a cultural level rather than on a human rights level. So that's the first thing. People, the state, the government must tell us now what is the clear path to take responsibility. At the, at the social level now, though, Within the homes, it's very, very difficult. I mean, we heard earlier the statistics about the amount of social workers to, um, to um, clients in the homes, the house mothers. Those conditions cannot continue. Now, in the interim, though, it takes cash to care, but it doesn't necessarily take cash to love. <laughs> there is a general um, apathy. There's a general um, disconnect that we're just doing our work. That has to change. 
And I think part of that comes down to constant development of the care workers. I believe that most of them have the genuine hearts in right across CPFC. I mean, as an organization, I can state that our experience with CPFC has not been what we are seeing now. We do have girls who have come to us who have been abused by the state in general, but we have never made a report or um, have a need and reach out right across the island where we are. And we don't get a good response. And so that, I just want uh, to... Joy, sorry to interject. I must say it's the same experience from JFJ. And yeah. and this was a difficult advocacy for the organization in our response because the experience of CPFSA, we have come across very good caring people um, yeah. as well. So that one, yes. Thank you for sharing. So I wanted to say that. But I think the developmental piece, now we're talking about growth and development. A lot of the women and the men who work in the system have never been trained in basic growth and development, what are the milestones? I mean, I we I've had a, an experience with um adoption. I remember one of the reasons why that triggered us. We took a child one Christmas um in our home as you know in one of the campaigns, and the rest is history. She's now thirteen, and I remember when we went and we were trying to find this child. And Pat was my co-founder. We said what we want. The first of all, they told us that we should take a baby with pretty hair. And we said we didn't want a baby with pretty hair because we want somebody who looked like us. We didn't have Indian hair. And then after they were going around telling us all this, they said, oh, there's a child who is lazy and is always in our crib. Now, this child was um, 11 months. And she just lie down there and she lazy. How do you describe an 11 month old as lazy? And that was a trigger for us. We said, bring that one. Bring that one. That's a child that we would like to spend time with. They, 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 they tell us that she was lazy. This was the head of the, space, of, of the home that we were, were interfacing with. So the whole issue around how we look after our children, what we honor, it's missing. So I think that we have to go back to the drawing board. And it does, there are many entities in our, in our country um, who have good credibility, who can help, volunteer, donate some time, put some money into real capacity building of the staff, do clinical supervision, um, get them some counseling as well. Some of the staff there are terrified of the children. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to, how discipline look like. So there is a breakdown in the nurturing, developing culture of our child protection homes. It cannot be just that we keep them there, rain not bringing them up, we feed them, clean them. It has to be more than that. So that's one of the changes that we must look at. And it does not necessarily mean we'll have a lot of money, but it has to be on paper as a focus. And as we develop the facilities and we paint them, we develop the staff and the team to be more readily able to care for and to nurture and manage themselves so that they can manage the children. If not, the abuse will not stop. Thanks, Joy. Um, we have been calling for more social workers as you talk about that, but we are we, we, we are getting the, the, the little hint from the technical team that we have to close out. So one minute to Joy to close out um, around the sex offenders registry, which we know um, here, and I'm not sure Jade has anything to add to the sex offender before we turn over to Joy to close out with her advocacy in that regard. Uh, no, I actually had a, a, that was what I was going to ask Joy to just mm -hmm. articulate her position on the registry because as, as we're aware as advocates, it is not publicly available in, in such a wide sense as for example, it's available in other jurisdictions like the United States. Um, so Joy, what was... Okay, so I'll give it in one sentence so you can have another show. <laughs> <laughs> The conviction of sex offenders, when you go to court and get charged, is public information. So the sex offender registry can't be private. The sex offender registry is a repository of information. And that is my one thing. It is an oxymoron. <laughs> Okay. Right. Uh, Carol Narcis, human rights advocate, family member of JFJ, Joy Crawford, co-founder of E for Life, and, and, and cousin of JFJ, close family <laughs> member still. Thank you so much, ladies, for joining us and sharing your perspective. Um, Thank you. Thank you for the discussion. 
So we'll take a break, but we encourage persons, and um, we're going to read some of your comments on Instagram, Jade Will. Yes, and please call in if you have want to make a live comment at 876-676-4996. And we'll take the break. The people's champion. Our mission is love. Our vision is love. Jamaicans for justice. The people's champion. One Jamaica, looking at the bigger picture. Imagine your advertising dollar reaching your Caribbean and diaspora target beyond borders in a single rotation. It happens only on the bridge. Call now to advertise. 876-669-5000. Hi, I'm Ronald Thwaites, and I'm the host of The Public Eye and The Open Mind on The Bridge 99 and Irie Jam in the tri-state area. This program will tell you the truth about life back a yard. Fair, open talk. No gossip, no slander. We want to listen to your concerns. Also want to help you with your problems in JA. We at The Bridge rate you and affirm our oneness as citizens of this blessed land we love. So join us now on Wednesdays on The Bridge. Crossing the waters, linking Jamaicans and Jamaican lovers everywhere. Lad, Keisha, you hear about the little girl we get shot in the community last week? What do you mean? I'm here to say things are going to get even crazy, I know, because them boys are smuggling mm. some new gun the other day. If me could have said something without bad man here about my name, I would have talked with me know a long time, mm. you know, because for them foolishness, always come back for hurt the innocent people in the community. But you know, say, them have one program where you can actually get information to the police secretly, you know. Mm. Customs join up with Crime Stop and start one campaign named Tell Us, mm. so people can give tips and nobody nothing will say them. Them all give out money if the reward lead to an arrest or them can't find the gun them. Boy, honestly, I'm kind of afraid, you know. But things can't continue, mm-hmm. so. I'm ready to tell them when I know. You're right. We have to put a stop to it. The Jamaica Customs Agency wants you to tell us what you know. Call Crime Stop at 311 to share information about illegal guns and other contraband coming through our borders. The Jamaica Customs Agency, country above self. It's 29 years of the people's show. Let me tell you. 2023. Friday, January the 20th. Big Mountain. Third World. Cody Rap. Yuckster. Yes, right. Blue to Sherrington and Ernie Smith. Heavyweight Rock. Glenn Washington. Ring dog. Gates open 5 p.m. Action begins 7 p.m. Tickets are 8,500 pre-sold and 9,000 at the gate. 29 years of niceness. The people show. Endorsed by Bridge 99 FM. The Bridge 99 FM, the Caribbean's cultural capital. Welcome back to Let's Start Justice. Um, we are talking today about the OCA's report on Carl Rabansky and, of course, child protection and reform in that child protection area. And um, we did ask a public view this week, um, a very popular public view. Uh, <laughs> we got a lot of comments on this one, um, but I'm not surprised because it's a very touchy issue. A lot of persons were outraged by the findings in the report. A lot of persons continue to be outraged by what they perceive to be a lack of, what should I say, a lack of expediency in Mm -hmm. dealing with the the issues from they were first reported in 2018, I think, um, persons. Yeah, when it first came to CPFSA's attention. Yes. Um, So we have a few comments here. I'm going to avoid the usernames because uh, I, I wouldn't want anyone to <laughs> to feel as though they've been singled out. <laughs> um, but first suggestion that we have here, so our public view question stated, what steps do you think should be put in place to better protect children in state care? So, and re- be reminded that you can give us a call in at 676-4996 to make a comment on this as well. Um, So the first comment that we have says we should train all staff in homes and agencies in trauma informed evidence based practices and attachment theory, proper screening of all staff, including psychometric testing, staff the homes and agencies with enough people, pay them well, observe them closely and fire any person suspected of inappropriate behavior. 
support the parents in accessing therapy and training and economic skills to create safe family homes. Sounds like this person read a, a submission from JFJ. No, but but uh, that, that, that recommendation, all of them, some of them are within the OCA report. Some are actually in keeping with the, um, the, the Convention of the Rights of the Child in terms of monitoring state homes. So mm. the, that, that, that person is quite <laughs> yes. on point. Quite on point, quite on point indeed. Um, we also have... What should be put in place, remove the people that don't care, that are two-faced, that pretend before y'all and behind y'all. They're the devil's advocate. <laughs> Give a voice to the children. Listen when they say things happen and stop letting politicians and upper class people have their way with them. Um, okay, but <laughs> interesting. Yes. Right, but to put things in perspective, I like the point about listening to children because yes. sometimes you do see some evidence, and we spoke about that a couple um, weeks ago when we had CPFSA here yes. with us um, as well, talking about the signs of child abuse. So we should we should be watching those signs certainly and responding accordingly. Yeah, and what I liked too is that um, we have to create a safe environment for children to share this information. Mm -hmm. um, so if the child feels as though, like we would have seen in the report, as though they might receive backlash. They're somehow for, beholden. Yes, they're somehow beholden to their abuse and therefore... And, and we did see in the report that um, some of the persons who spoke to the OCA were ostracized from mm -hmm. the other members of, in the home. They reported that um, they were excluded from certain things once it was found out that they would have spoken about the issue with the OCA. And, and you know, Jade, one of the conversations to be had at some point, um, watching the time closely, is, is the matter of how persons within these institutions feel as if they can report. Mm -hmm. Because one of the concerns coming out of the OCA report was that there was an obstruction of investigation um, from the leadership of CPFSA. And JFJ has in fact called for an investigation to determine who those persons are mm -hmm. so that they can be held to account whether it is that that being held to account is criminal charges and other disciplinary actions. But when you have a duty of care and you believe as if you can't speak, mm -hmm. um, certain persons spoke to the, the, the children's advocate to indicate that they felt intimidated, whether or not if they spoke, you know... They might lose their jobs. I mean, I mean these things are very alarming. Yes. And, and, and the question is, where was the monitoring officer in all of this? at the CPFSA to know what was happening. So there are several areas of concern in that report, you know, that JFJ and other human rights, women's group, children's advocate group, I'm saying to all of us, we cannot, no matter how short-staffed we are and stressed we are, there's no way our advocacy can make this a nine-day wonder. And I want to say kudos to the media in Jamaica. I don't know the motivation for some because I'm sure it makes a good headlines. But I want to say particular thanks to the news station that broke the story in 2021 and mm -hmm. followed up with it. Because this is the role that the media has to play when others are not able to play that particular function. Mm -hmm. The media brought this to the public's attention, yes. to the ministry's attention, and certainly as human rights or organization, we must follow up with the advocacy. We cannot make 2023 pass and the government of Jamaica, they do not act on the recommendations for making amendments to the Child Care and Protection Act. So Jade, you're the policy specialist here at JFJ, so may I tell you straight up, <laughs> I know 90 you wonder this for JFJ. You have your work cut ahead of you, eh? Yes, absolutely. Carried already? Exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so, um, so let's the trivia. Yes, we're going to wrap up the show now. Um, we, I'm, I'm afraid the trivia this week is going to cause some contention because we did get what could appear to be two correct answers. But one of the answers added a qualification that makes it more correct. So the question Make it was, more or less correct. I thought you said I right or wrong. No, ma'am. <laughs> okay. So the question was, what is the maximum fine and term of imprisonment for persons who fail to report instances of child abuse? Um, so who I'm going to crown the winner is, is a regular winner, actually. <laughs> it's Confident Palmer, um, which the answer was six months imprisonment, a fine of $500,000 or both. That is the correct answer. Um, however, we did get a second answer. So I just want to give a shout out to Kimi. 
um, who also said $500,000 or imprisonment not exceeding six months, but she didn't add the or both. So Confident gets this one. Thank so confident you. Confident never answer Kimmy would have win. Yes, okay. yes. <laughs> um, so it's all about ac- accuracy here at JFJ for our <laughs> trivia questions of the week. All right, so that's the end of our program. Thank you so much to our listeners, and we hope to continue to build the audience. My name is Mikkel Jackson, Executive Director. And I'm Jade Williams, Policy and Advocacy Specialist. And we'll see you next week, 1 o'clock. Take care. The people's champion. Our mission is love. Our vision is love. Jamaicans, for justice. The people's champion. Champion. Justice, justice for all, justice under the law, justice to make a demand, right to life, right to liberty, justice, justice for all, justice under the law, justice the people demand, right to life and security. Oh, what a child, oh, what a child, oh, what a FM, keeping the Caribbean connected. We up ya, we up ya. Calling all bridge builders to the Bridge 99 FM, your global partners for outside broadcasts, connecting you from Jamaica to the world. Where will we go? From Kingston to Portmore, downtown, Spanish Town, Canada, USA, and as far as Dubai, we, we keep, keep you connected, connected across, across the, the seven, seven continents, continents of the globe. Of the globe. Call us at 876-630-3153 for information about partnering with the Bridge 99.